let's begin. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, reminds me of, of the uh, good old days of COVID uh, lectures, um, which I really don't like, but we had to do that because of the power outage. They restored it about half an hour ago, but you know, there was, uh, I couldn't make, and nobody can make it in time now. So we'll just do this over Zoom today. We'll dedicate it to a, uh, we'll make it a fully coding session. So uh, and we'll dig deep into it. And if you remember, well, before, before you remember, I wanna point out a couple of things. Um, I hope you started on project two, and I hope you started on you're all you're working on the channel flow by now if you haven't gotten that figured out you should be like 90 percent there if not you're really behind and you're gonna quickly fall behind even if you have this weekend um to work on it um remember um so uh, uh, this weekend is gonna be packed and busy because of pioneer day and so um really try to push yourself to try to get something working um, by the end of this week. I hope you already got started. I know a couple of you already have results, um, good working results for the flow in a channel, and they're starting to work on the intrusion on the flow over an object, uh, which is for extra credit. So um, I don't know where you're at on the project, uh, but you sh you sh I really encourage you to get to get moving on them like ASAP immediately, um, not even ASAP, like immediately, because as soon as possible could be next month, right? Because that's, if that's what's possible, then that's the soon as possible. Immediately means like right now, okay? So um, I, I hope you, you get to that. And again, we've been helping um, you individually get through these, um, this, get this project working. Um, again, you should, I hope you're like 90% there for this channel flow, trying to figure out the boundary conditions and comparing with the analytical solution. Today, I want to follow up on, I want to follow our discussion on, uh, f uh, the discussion on hyperbolic equations. And we went through, if you remember, we went through a bunch of uh, schemes to compute the fluxes for just a simple advection equation. We took a finite volume formulation. We said that um, the right-hand side convective or diffusive flux, in this case, the convective flux, um, essentially is the divergence of the deflex, advective flux. So you have that difference between east, west, north, and south, um, top and bottom in 3D um, between the fluxes. And then we focused on approximating the fluxes. We talked about different kinds of appro approximations, upwinding, second order, um, central, second order, second order, upwind, quadratic, and so on and so forth. And we ended up summarizing everything with the K scheme. And this was the nomenclature we used. We are typically at some phase F, trying to compute the flux at that phase. Um, and the flux is the speed, in this case, is the speed times the face value. So um, speed times phi f. So this phi f, um, that's important over here. Let me get and let me just annotate a little bit here. So if you remember, this phi f is what we are after, okay? Um, and so the flux was simply, in this case, c times phi f with a, you know, with a constant speed. Or if the speed is not constant, it, it actually would live on this face over here, okay? So um, we focused on figuring out ways to compute this phi f, all right? And let me just cancel out these uh, all drawings, okay? And let me go back to here. And the case scheme uh, kind of summarized uh, or was a generalization of all of the schemes that we had developed uh, from quick second order upwind, third order upwind, and so on. And it combined the upwind value, which was phi c. If you remember, this um, c over here was the upwind value with respect to the phase. If the flow is going from left to right, if the flow is going from right to left, this would be phi upwind. And then d is downwind, u is far upwind, double d is um, uh, far downwind and w is far far upwind okay 
And we came up with the K scheme, which is a combination of um, some forward bias differencing and so some downwinding and some upwinding. You see a blend of the two and we had this K parameter combining these two slopes. Um, for K equal minus one, we recovered second order upwind. For K equal zero, we recovered the from scheme. For K equal half, we recovered quick. Remember quick fit a parabola between the different um, cell values. Um, K equal one third is a third order upwind and so on and so forth. Now, if you um, write the expand the entire this entire formula here, um, this phi f equal phi upwind plus h over two, etc. If you expand all of that, you get this um, nice formula over here: phi f equal phi upwind plus one minus k over four phi upwind minus phi four far upwind plus one minus k over one plus k over four phi downwind minus phi upwind. Okay, so it kind of balances all of those, and this is what we are going to implement today. And if you remember. So let me go through these. We covered these um, last time. So this is the this is what we're gonna implement today. We're gonna take the advection equ equation d phi by dt equal minus some constant speed um, positive for now um, times d phi by dx. Now this whole thing c d phi by dx uh, is, sorry c times phi is the entire flux and we write this as d by dx of the flux f where the flux f is simply the speed times um, the phi value, okay? Now, in a finite volume situation, um, this would result in phi east minus phi west over delta x, but that would give you only like a first order approximation. Um, so we, uh, in time, if you were just to do that um, uh, as a, like an upwinding or central on the flux and do a forward Euler, but we wanted to get second order and with second order, if you remember the slide where I, approximated the integral over the time step by the midpoint rule um, and that midpoint rule essentially starts here in this formula so this would be the formula for the midpoint rule is phi n plus one is phi n minus delta t over delta x flux east minus flux west at n plus half because that's the midpoint in the time step n plus half okay now we don't know n plus half we have no information at n plus half so to get n plus half we do a uh, before we get to n plus half we do a simple forward euler calculation half a time step so we go from phi n to phi n plus half using a forward euler approximation and for the fluxes you still have the difference flux east which is you know i plus half minus flux west which is i minus half okay now you do this as an upwind for this step for the predictor you it's sufficient to do this in a, as an upwind you'll still recover second order in time now the upwind tells you that, so if you take this flux F at the east face or the west face, doesn't matter, Fn is C times the face value of phi. If you're upwinding, the face value of phi is simply the upwinded value of phi. And you see how we can go from C times face value of phi to C times phi at the upwinded um, value. Okay, so this is a little different from the way we wrote it at the beginning of the semester where we directly embedded um, um, phi upwinding in the finite difference formula. This is actually more sophisticated and more um, amenable to the framework that we're developing here, okay? Now, in the corrector step, so once you have phi at n plus half, you can use those to compute f at n plus half. Remember f is c times phi, right? So f n plus half is c times phi n plus half, which is right here, okay? So this is f at n plus half, east or west, it doesn't matter, right? Um, so it would be c times face value of phi at n plus half, okay? Now we have those, we have everything at n plus half. Um, now this is where our case scheme comes in. We're gonna say that the phase value of phi is this entire guy so so this should be multiplied actually by by the speed c so there should be a c multiplying this over here okay so this the whole thing the, in red is the face value of phi according to the k scheme okay this is what we're going to implement today all right now the way we're going to implement this and because i'm planning maybe in the future we're going to be using um we're going to be using far far upwind or far downwind so w w u and dd so i'm going to, i'm probably going to need 
two points um, on at the end of each domain, right? So if I am at this grid shown in green here, if I need a W two U two upwinded values, so far far upwind, I'm gonna need to go two cells to the left or two cells to the right. So to preempt this, I'm just going to add two ghost cells to this grid. Now, if your scheme extends to three points or four points on, on the upwind direction or downwind direction, you need to add three or four or five ghost cells in each direction just to be able to, to, be able to approximate all of that, okay? So what I'm going to do, I'm, uh, phi is a cell-centered value, and I'm going to add two ghost cells on each, on each side. Today, we're not going to need those two ghost cells. We will only need one of them. Um, but in case we have a scheme later when we do TVD schemes, um, which are the fancier schemes than these, um, we might need two values downstream or two values upstream. So I'm going to create the two ghost cells anyway. Remember, ghost cells are just allow us to store temporary values to make our calculations easy and efficient. Okay. So therefore, if my grid resolution, if my grid si number of grid points is nx, then my total in, in the interior of the domain, so whatever you see here in green, then I will need two ghost cells at each side, and that will make the total number of cell-centered grid points or cell-centered cells nx plus 4. So phi will be an array of size nx plus 4. Okay? Now, for the fluxes, remember the fluxes, they live at the faces. We never stored the fluxes in the past. Today, we're going to start thinking in terms of fluxes. So I will need to store a flux value at each one of the faces. Now, if you count with me, you, if you have n plus, nx plus 4 cells, how many faces do you have? You have nx plus 5 faces. Okay, so if you count with me, you have nx plus 4 cells, you would have one extra face on top of those nx plus 4. So the flux array needs to be of size nx plus 5. So I'll show you the indexing over here. So if phi is of size nx plus 4 and the flux f, which is speed times face value of phi, is going to be of size nx plus 5. And this is how I count them. So for phi, this would be cell number 0. In Python indexing, this would be cell number one. Let me annotate here. Okay, this would be cell number zero, cell number one, two, three, and so on, all the way nx plus one, nx plus two, nx plus three, for a total of nx plus four, right? Zero to nx plus three gives you nx plus four cells. Now, the faces, the fluxes are going to be stored at the faces over here, okay? So this would be my first index for the flux, second index, third index all the way to the last one, okay? All the way to the last one. So you can count with me 0, 1, 2, all the way to um, nx plus 2 over here, nx plus 1 over here, nx plus 3, and nx plus 4 for a total of nx plus 5. So this is the absolute index of um, uh, this uh, array for f. So we're going to come back to this as we plan our implementation. Obviously, we are not going to compute things in the ghost cells, um, especially if we are because we're going to be periodic. Um, so for periodicity, what we're going to do, um, let me get this. What we're going to do for periodicity, remember, periodicity is going to repeat this grid, this green grid, both to the left and to the right. So if you were take, to take this entire grid and put it to the right, then this point here, this point here would align with this point here. And this point here would align with this point here, right? So that's why if I seed those ghost values with these values from the interior, then that would replicate essentially this grid on the right. And same thing on the left-hand side, these two ghost points will be seeded by values from this guy over here. And once you have the values here, you can easily compute um, the fluxes. Now, obviously, we're not going to need a flux over here. Um, the worst we're going to need is a flux at this point over here, okay? Because that's the first interior point essentially right at the boundary if you want. So we're going to need uh, to be able to compute a flux over here. And that's why I need those two values over here, okay? So let me clean this up, clear all drawings. Okay, 
So um, let's grab our Jupyter Notebooks, please, and we can start our uh, planning our implementation. Okay, we're gonna do the, these things, things very differently today from what you're used to. Um, and I cannot see you because I have like a thousand windows in front of me. So excuse me, if you have a question, please just speak up. Okay, so I'm going to create a new notebook over here and let me know if you're th seeing things okay. Is this okay? Yep. Yeah, it looks good. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to do, um, let's call this um, 2024 implementation of the a scheme using fluxes. Okay. So we will do our typical um, boilerplate. If, if, we need to, if we need to, we're gonna come back to these equations over here, because that's the those are the equations that we're going to implement. I'm gonna put them maybe here on the side, okay? And uh, so I'm not gonna write any, any text or discussion. I'm just gonna do my boilerplate stuff. Um, import numpy as np and math matplotlib inline um, and we I'm gonna copy and paste this guy over here okay I'm gonna copy and paste this guy um, and then import import matplotlib.pyplot as plt for plotting I'm gonna do some animations we're gonna do them differently today um, you see a little trick I remembered um, so import matplotlib dot animation as animation and then plt dot rc params um, animation dot html uh, this just works <laughs> so this will allow us to embed the animation in the notebook okay um, a lot of googling and um, um, and uh, Reddit <laughs> stuff okay. All right, so we import these guys. Uh, come on. Okay, got it. All right. Now I will need an interesting initial condition to test these schemes. Now remember, one uh, the observation we saw last time was that um, whatever we tried, it we, it always the these schemes they always gave us wiggles, this, regardless of the value of k. And I had here a sharp a little sharp signal. Um, right, like a little step over here. And so um, for smooth signals, you're not gonna see any significant dispersion, but when you have shocks um, or sharp gradients, you are going to see dispersion. So that's what we're going to test the schemes for. So I'm gonna create a, uh, a combination, a Gaussian and a uh, step function together so that we see that the Gaussian is not going to be affected much because it's going to be nice and smooth, but the step function, which displays a sharp gradient, is going to show uh, dispersion, quite a bit of dispersion. So I'll define this as two uh, Python routines. Um, we'll start with the step, define step, and the step I want it to be centered at x0, x0, and it will be a function of x. And so um, let's sorry x0 and um, x1 so that's the width of that step uh, so we're given x0 and x1 and the result is going to be x um, minus x0 okay so now i'm taking the difference between x and x0 now if result um, if x minus x1 is less than x1 okay we're gonna have a value of one and everywhere else is going to be zero, x less than x zero. If x is less than x zero, we're gonna have 0, 0.0 and result if x um, is greater than x one, um, or you could have initialized everything um, um, essentially with, uh, with ones and then reset every everything to um, return results, put everything else to zero. Okay, so let's try this out x is mp dot um, lin space so now 
my lint space, I'm going to start from the mo the ghost cell on the left. So remember, this one, this first interior point starts at delta x over two. So the first um, ghost cell is um, minus delta x over two. And so if this is zero minus delta x over two, minus um, delta x. And if I'm gonna start from over here, so if, if let's see, if we wanna start from over here, this leftmost um, value, um, let me see what I have here. Minus delta x over two, minus delta x over two, so minus delta x over two, minus three delta x over two, right. So if this is zero, if our domain starts, yeah, sorry, this took me a minute. <laughs> um, okay, so if our domain is going to start here at zero, this would be minus delta x over two, minus delta x over two, minus delta x over two. So minus three delta x over two is going to be our um, first interior point, uh, sorry, our first in that ghost cell here, cell centered value. And the last one is going to be at L plus three delta x over two, okay? So let's do that. And so obviously we need some number of grid points. Um, let me clear this. And again, this is like, you don't have to do it exactly this way. It's just one way of doing it. Um, L, let's say the domain size is one. We're starting from X equals zero. And I'm going to put 256 grid points because we're in one D is pretty cheap. Um, and my DX is going to be L over N, right? Because we're, we're finite volume. Um, how many cells do we have? is L over N, so that's my delta X spacing. And N is the number of interior grid points, so that is the green, those cells in green, okay? So everything in green over here, not the ghost cells, okay? That's what we're defining. You don't give the domain, if a user comes and says, if you're writing a function interface or a, a routine for your code, you don't give them the option to put the, uh, you know, the total number with ghost cells. No, you give them the option, how many points on the interior of the domain and you internally deal with however ghost cells, however many ghost cells your scheme is going to need. So we're gonna start from minus three times dx over two, okay? All the way, so two, all the way to L plus three times dx over two. And I will need N plus four points, right? Because this is, I have two ghost cells on each side. Okay, so I have N plus four cells, okay? And so let's go ahead and um, plot this, plt dot plot um, X and step function. I'm gonna take X and I'm gonna place, let's say um, the step function at 0 0.6, let's say and 0 0.8. Excuse me, and this is what you get. Okay, you can place it, you know, and the, uh, the reason I placed it here is because I'm gonna put a Gaussian um, right to its left, okay? <laughs> so let's go ahead and define a simple um, Gaussian. Define Gaussian, um, again, X and X zero. So, and I will return, um, let's give it a standard um, deviation, um, 0 0.08, um, and then result will be MP dot, exp minus x minus x0. Remember the formula for the Gaussian, x minus x0 squared over standard deviation squared. Okay, so this should work and then return result. Okay, so now I'm going to try this out as well. So let me take this guy out. So I'm gonna plot the Gaussian over here. Gaussian and let's place it at 0 0.3 for example. Okay, um, oh, I didn't execute this. All right, so okay, great, it gave me a Gaussian. So now I'm gonna blend the two functions together um, for, in, for my initial condition. So I'm gonna say that my phi zero or my initial condition, phi zero, which is the initial condition, so let's see, create, create the initial condition as a combo of the Gaussian, Gaussian and step function. 
Okay, so phi zero is going to be um, Gaussian um, at 0 0.3, right? Plus the step function. Um, again, I'm going to put 0 0.6 and 0 0.8 for x0 and x1. And we can then plot phi zero. Okay, great. Okay, so this is what I want. Okay, so I'm com I've combined the Gaussian and that step function, and we're gonna we're going to advect this initial condition. Okay, at a constant speed, and we're gonna see what happens. What's gonna happen to the Gaussian? What's gonna happen to that um, step function, which represents a very very sharp gradient? Okay. All right. Any questions so far? All right, so let's move on. Um, now we'll, we will create our solution arrays. So create um, solution arrays. I need an array. We need an array for phi and an array for the fluxes. Okay, so phi, I'm going to call it, um, let's call it phi is mp dot zeros um, of size nx or n plus four, right? And the fluxes um, is going to be mp dot zeros of size n plus five. Agreed? That's kind of what we discussed on the slides. Okay, perfect. And now for our um, stable time step, stable time step based, based on Quran number, number remember the Quran number was C times DT over DX right so I'm gonna set my Quran number I'm gonna say Quran is equal 0 0.5 so in every time step I'm only moving half a grid cell okay uh, if my Quran is 0 0.1 then I'm moving 10% of a grid cell if my Quran is 1 I'm moving one full grid cell okay so that kind of adjusts our uh, expectation for how fast we're moving this and I'm going by the assumption that the CFL condition holds that we need the Quran number to be less than one. When you go to second order, you can you can push that a little bit, but I would still be conservative about it and take my Quran number at one. Okay, so note for a second order in time scheme, you can push the Quran number um, Above, slightly above one, slightly above one, but for safety, <laughs> let's keep it below one, okay? For safety, what a non scientific statement, okay? <laughs> All right, so and if my speed is 1.0 um, meter per second, so that's speed. All right, so then I can infer my dt is equal to um, courant times um, dx over the speed. And then print dt is equal to dt in seconds. Okay, so that would give me 0 0.002 seconds for, um, for my time step for this problem. Okay? Okay, perfect. So now we start um, time advance, time advance loop. Time advance loop. All right, so we're implementing we're implementing the k scheme. So I need a value for k. I'm gonna start with 0 0.5. Whatever, we'll change it in a second. I'm gonna start from t equals zero. And now, how many? How long do we want to run this? I want to run this for at least one residence time or one cycle, right? So I want the initial signal to start from where it is, go through the boundary and as if it's kind of circling back and coming to where it started. So the way I estimate that, remember the signal is moving at a speed C and a distance L. So the time it would take for it to cover a distance L at, at speed C is simply going to be L over C, right? It's going to be L over C. And check the dimensions, they're correct. So what this does, this covers a single um, residence time or cycle through the domain, through the domain. Make sense? So any point on this initial condition, 
all points are moving at speed c well they're assumed to right and so and they're covering a distance if i want them to go to go out of the boundary and come back to where they started that's a distance total distance l okay so the time it would take to cover that distance at a speed c would be l over c okay now I'm going to start to store my solution because this is a 1D problem. It's easy to store and animate. For 2D, don't do that. Um, if you're animating the stuff for the flow over the object in the project two, it's gonna take you thousands and thousands of time steps. Do not um, store the solution instead. Dump it into a JPEG and then animate the J the JPEGs um, as a post processing step okay so the re the only time i do animations in python and jupyter notebooks is when the calculation is lightweight or like one dimensional problems they don't take much long a much a lot of time but any any serious calculation you have to instead don't store the solution don't bloat your memory and instead save the images for each like do a few trial runs first make sure pictures look okay etc and then save your plots as JPEGs and then animate them outside of Python. Okay. All right. So let's create an um, create an empty an empty list for the solution in time. Okay. So I'm going to store each solution in this one, and um, we're going to start by appending sol.append phi zero. Obviously, the initial condition, and I'm going to also store um, a series of um, so I'm going to do the, the plotting and the, the animation a little bit differently today. I'm going to store the plots um, in, in variables. And so I'm going to call this array um, images. So or list, sorry, list to store the plots. Okay. All right. And um, let's see. Okay. So now we can initialize. So this is all still boil, boilerplate, okay? Nothing, um, uh, nothing serious going on here. Just kind of visualization stuff. I'm going to create a figure, plt dot figure. Uh, I'm going to give it a size um, like five, like a golden ratio, aspect ratio, and DPI 200 DPI. So it looks nice. And I'm going to create my to plot my initial condition plt.plot and I'm going to plot only the interior points okay so I'm gonna skip the ghost cells now the interior points remember our x array the um, the x values for the coordinate um, uh, they also include ghost cells I don't want to include ghost cells in my plotting and just want to plot the interior so I'm going to start from 2 to minus 2 right why we have two ghost cells in your codes or what we've done so far, we had one ghost cell, so we'd go from one to minus one. But here I need to go from two, so look at phi here. I'm going to go from two to minus two. So at the end, if you if you index from the end, this would be minus one and this would be minus two. Okay, so taking all of these points would go from two to minus two because the last number over here is an open interval, okay? And I'm going to plot um, phi zero also from two to minus two and um, whatever, make it black and animated equal true. So this is an option that you could use if you are um, using your plots as part of a global animation. Apparently Python does something for it. Um, you know, again, this is just for illustration purposes. My serious animations are done as JPEGs and I up and I animate the JPEGs outside of Python, okay? All right, so finally now we can start a, um, a, uh, a for loop or a, a time, Mark? pardon me, yes. Sorry, one question. Have you, uh, have you figured out how to export these? Like if you wanted to do this in a presentation? So again, I would save plt.savefig and I would just save the figures um, what, what do you mean export the animation? Yeah, so you're saying you're, you're creating a list of, of uh, plots saved. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I don't save this, but you can, once we create the animation, you can, you could do anima animation.save and just save it into a file. Ah, okay, thanks. Yeah, but I, again, I don't do that. I, I usually 
export JPEGs and animate the JPEGs outside of Python using mm -hmm. FFmpeg or Image Magic. Um, you know, there's like, and it depends on your platform. I'm not sure it will work on Windows. Um, if you download FFmpeg, it's, it's the best to do these kinds of animations. Um, but here, yeah, so if you do this animation, we can try it at the end. You can do, um, you can just save the animation, animation.save and put it in an MP4 file or something. Okay, so we'll try it. We'll try it at the end. But if I if I were you, I would just do plt plt dot save fig and just save it at each each time you're plotting. I would save the fig as a JPEG, and then animate the JPEGs externally. Okay. So now let's do our time advance while t less than or equal to t end. Okay. Um, first thing we're gonna do is get seed our old solution phi n. And that's going to be sol minus one. So that's going to store the old solution. Okay. Because we initially started our sol, we appended phi zero. So that's going to be our, you know, previous solution phi n. Now, if we go back to our formula over here, my first step is going to be to do this predictor. Okay. I'm going, I'm going to need phi n uh, minus delta t over two delta x times flux east minus flux west and so on. Okay. So, now, if your initial condition, um, uh, you can enforce, if you want, periodic boundary conditions over here. It's not necessary if you bring in your initial condition with periodic boundary conditions enforced already, which is generally a preference, um, but you can do it here as well. So enforce um, periodic BCs, okay? force periodic BCs. So what I'm going to do is exactly this. So phi minus two is equal to phi two and phi minus one is equal to phi three. Agreed? So um, phi minus two is equal to phi two. Sorry, phi n. <laughs> phi n, my, my bad, okay, is equal to phi two. And then phi minus one is equal to phi three. Okay. So just like the phi, sorry, phi n, <laughs> keep making that same mistake. Okay, phi n, right? So those are the two ghost points over here. And same thing for the ghost points on the left. Um, so phi zero is going to be phi minus two, uh, sorry, phi, yes, minus, minus three. Phi zero is going to be phi minus three and phi one is going to be phi minus four, okay? That makes sense. Okay, so um, yes, phi one is going to be. Um, sorry, I made a mistake here. No, no, no. Yeah, this is correct. So phi one. Yeah. So if we were to take this grid and place it over here. Um, okay. So if you were to take this point and put it over, it's going to line up over here, right? So this point is minus one, minus two, minus three is going to seed phi one. Okay. So phi one, phi n one is going to be phi n minus um, three, right? Phi one is phi n minus three and phi n um, zero is going to be phi n minus four. Okay. So this guy over here is going to seed this value. Okay. So it's as if you took the entire grid and put it over there. Okay. So same way phi two seeded phi minus two and phi three seeded phi minus one. Phi minus three is going to seed phi one and phi minus four is going to seed phi zero. Okay. Okay. All right. So now this is where uh, the rubber hits the road. Okay. So now I need to evaluate all the fluxes. Okay. At all the different, um, at all the different phases. Okay, now I'm going to do this only on the interior points. So if you look at um, at the flux values over here, so if you look at all the flux values over here, 
I need to fill in this first one over here at two. So let me get the annotation over here. So I need to fill this value. I need to fill this value. Okay, so we're gonna go from all the way from two all the way to this guy. Now, where is this guy located? At minus one, minus two. Okay, so this whole series of fluxes, they go from two to minus two. Okay? Does that make sense? So this whole series of fluxes where I need flux values because I'm interested in computing the fee values eventually only in the interior points, right? And for each interior point, I need flux east minus flux west. So that's the most I need to go to in terms of the fluxes, okay? So my calculation needs to run from, I need to do something like flux from two to minus two is equal C times phi F, okay? The phase value, that's at the phase value. All right, so what are we doing here? We are at the predictor. Now my predictor over here is saying I only need the upwinded value. Okay, so you see this guy over here, C times phi phase, and phi phase the, for the predictor is upwind. So all I need to do is identify what are the upwinded value. Now I know that in this problem, my flow is going from left to right. So the upwind value is always towards the left, okay? So I can store all my upwinded values with respect to the faces, okay? So what are the upwinded values with respect to the faces? So let's do it. Phi C, and I'm gonna ask you to do it. So Phi C, okay, is equal Phi N, I need an array that contains all the upwinded values with respect to the faces. So what is the upwinded value? We're starting with the face. Remember, we're computing the fluxes. Okay, we have determined that we only need the fluxes at this one, this one, this one, this one, all the way to this guy, right? Okay, now these are our faces. So I'm gonna go through this first face, second face, third. What is the upwinded value with respect to each face? So let's start at this phase. What's the upwinded value? This guy, right? What's the upwinded value for this one? It's this guy, this guy, oops, this guy, this guy, and finally this guy. Okay? So now this would these guys contain all of them, they contain my upwinded values, right? With respect to the fluxes. The faces are, let me change the color. So the faces are over here, right? These are the faces that I'm interested in. And I already, I already specified the array for those faces over here. The upwinded value with respect to those faces are those in red, agreed? So what would that be in terms of slicing? <coughs> On phi. a question. <coughs> what is the range of indexing for the slice for the upwinded values? The one to nx minus two. One, okay, so you're right, one. On the left, no, you're gonna go to an x plus one. Nx plus one. Yeah. Right, or minus two. Then minus two, yeah. That's yeah, right. yep, that's what you meant. So that's, that's exactly right. Okay, good. So see what I'm doing here? I'm grabbing all the upwinded values as one array, not doing four loops and thinking it's just one single array, putting all the upwinded values in that array. So phi upwind with respect to the flux values that I determined here, I already chose my flux values to be the interior values. Excuse me, so that array needs to be consistent with this one. And it's going to go, phi n is going to go from 1 to minus 2. So this one is going to give me all of the upwinded values here. This one, this one, this one, this one, all the way to this one. Okay. Now, my flux, I can evaluate my flux as c times phi upwind. So speed times phi upwind, which is exactly this formula. See how clean this is? 
just a little bit of extra thinking and you make it super clean, okay? But you have to recognize where your flux values live, where you're calculating your fluxes. If for some reason you're calculating the fluxes in the ghost cells, then your indexing needs to change consistently because those two arrays need to be of the same size, okay? This array needs to be of the same size as this one, and it is, okay? It is of the, of the same size because phi n is nx plus 4, phi flux is nx plus 5, so 2 to minus 2 is the same as 1 to minus 2 here. Okay, so this would be the same size. Okay, so now that I have the flux, the flux values, I can finally compute my predictor. This is my predictor here. Okay, this would be, this is my predictor. Phi n, okay, phi n minus delta t over 2 delta x times flux east minus flux west. Okay. So now, now that you have all the values at the flux at the faces, all the flux values at the faces, now it's time to take their differences. Okay, so how do we do this? I'm going to say phi, okay, on all um, the cell centers or all the interior values where I'm interested in. Okay, so I'm going to go again from 2 to minus 2. So 2... 2 minus 2, so now predictor, um, which is a forward Euler step, predictor on interior values only, okay? Predictor on interior values only, okay? So that's going to be phi from 2 to minus 2 only on the interior values. It needs to look like phi n uh, from um, 2 to minus 2. So again, this is the predictor. So I need a little array here. We didn't declare this guy. So I'm going to declare an array um, of phi, which is mp dot zeros like phi zero. Okay. So it will be of size n plus four. Okay. So this is what I'm storing my predictor, which is which which is what I'm going to use for the corrector. So this is going to give us phi n plus half. Okay. So this would give, this will give phi at, at n plus half, okay? All right, so this would be only on the interior points. And hold on, let me just add some cells over here. So this becomes in the middle. Okay. Now minus C times dt over dx, which is really the Quran number, okay? Times, okay, flux east, flux east minus flux west. Agreed? That's what this is doing here. I plus half, I minus half, doesn't matter. It's flux east minus flux west. That's the finite volume method. Okay, so now what are the east fluxes? You just have to do this exercise once and your code will work for all cases. Okay, so now what are what is the uh, what is an array that stores all the east fluxes? So remember, we have flux values. Let me remind you, we have flux values on all these faces: this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. What is the subset of east fluxes? It's going to be this guy, right? This guy, all the way to this guy. Agreed? Those are the east fluxes with respect to the cell centers. Right? So what's the in what's the slicing formula here? The three to negative two. From three to negative two. That's correct. Yep. From three to negative two. Okay, so flux east. Flux east is equal flux from three to negative two. Now remember flux is an array that contains the fluxes at all of those faces. Flux from three to minus two is gonna give me the east fluxes. What about the west fluxes? The west fluxes with respect to the cell centers are going to be, so again, this was my first value all the way to the last one here. My west fluxes are going to be these guys. So let me put, make it in red. It's going to be this, 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 
this, this. Those are the west fluxes. So what's the slicing formula? Two to minus three. Two to minus three, that's correct. That's correct. Okay, so let's clear all the drawings. So now flux west is flux from two to minus three. And you can, you, and, and you will bet, you make sure that all of these arrays are consistent with each other. I know the indexing is weird because these arrays have different sizes. The indexing is different, but at least the flux arrays that are of the same size and they should be consistent with the phi array. Okay. So now I have flux east minus flux west. Okay. Okay. Do you want to do something a little cooler than this? Or should we proceed and then we come and make it a little bit nicer um, in a minute? Okay, let's, let's proceed and make it a little bit nicer. Okay, so now I also want to enforce my enforce periodicity again on the, predict, on the predictor. Again, on the predictor, okay? because there's junk right now in the ghost cells. We didn't compute anything in the ghost cells, right? So I need to reseed them with proper values. So all I have to do is come back and copy and paste this. You can turn this into a routine that does it for you. You pass in the array and it does the, um, the periodicity, but this time we're doing periodicity on the predictor, phi. Okay, not phi n, phi n is old values. Okay, so now it's time to do the corrector. Right? Okay, if we go back to the formula for the corrector, again, we still had flux east minus flux west at n plus half. So that's fine. We can, we can fix, that's, that's going to be the last step. Okay, but look at the fluxes. The flux calculation over here is way more involved than the flux calculation for the upwind. So the flux calculation for the, for the character step involves phi upwind, phi upwind, phi far upwind, phi downwind, and phi upwind. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and create now arrays for upwind, far upwind, and downwind. Okay, so upwind, we already have it sorted out. So okay, let's say create arrays for um, upwind, see, copyright <laughs> for upwind u and um, downwind t. Okay. Okay. But you're creating those not on phi n, on phi n plus half, on phi at n plus half, right? Which we just computed. So I'm going to take this guy first, phi upwind, which we already created um, for the other guy, which we already solved for. But this time is going to be on phi, not on phi n. Remember, phi right now stores the predictor, phi n plus half. Okay. Okay. So now this is the upwind. What is the far upwind? This is a flow coming from left to right. Okay. This is a flow coming from left to right. What is the far upwind? So if the up... Two to negative one. Um, okay, so let's see. So if this is phi far upwind, okay? And this is going to be phi from, what did you say? Uh, two to negative one. No. Two to negative oh, one, that's going to be zero, zero, the downwind, yes. Two to negative one is going to be the downwind. The far, uh, the, uh, the far upwind is going to be exactly zero to negative three or just open to negative three, right? So essentially you've shifted phi upwind by one to the left. So you took phi upwind from one to minus two and you moved it by negative one. So it's gonna go from zero to minus three, okay? Now what is phi downwind? It's phi upwind plus one, right? You're gonna move it to the right. So phi downwind, phi downwind is going to be phi from two to minus one. So in terms of the array over here, of sorry, of the grid, again, this flow is going from left to right, okay? So at any phase, 
if you take all of these faces, the interior faces, we know what the upwind values are, we know what the far upwind values and the downwind values with respect to the faces again, okay? It's, it's beautiful because once you do this, you're done. You're done with the flux calculation. And you can do this conditionally on the direction of the velocity. Okay, so we leave, but that's best done for a two-dimensional problem where we have more conditional stuff going on. Um, but for the 1D case, you know, it kind of doesn't make sense to have change of sign in velocities, um, despite the example I gave in class the other day. Anyway, so now we have phi C, phi upwind, phi downwind, you're done. You're not thinking anymore in terms of I plus one, I plus half, you're thinking east, west, upwind, downwind, and so on and so forth. Agreed? Okay, so let's call this, give it some comments over here. Say this is upwind, far upwind, and this would be downwind. Okay, downwind. Okay, so now I'm going to do my flux calculation again. So I'm going to take this flux calculation here. Okay. Now, I could do an intermediate step and say f what phi at the faces are, at the face is, but I can just, let's just do this in one shot over here. So, I, the flux is C times the phase values. Now, what are the phase values? They're given to us by what? The K scheme over here, which is phi upwind. Okay, so I'm going to put phi C plus 1 minus K over 4. So... 1 minus k over 4 times phi upwind minus phi far upwind. Okay, so times phi upwind, phi upwind minus phi far upwind. The beauty of this nomenclature is that you use the indexing ones and you just reason about it in terms of upwind, downwind, which is much cleaner in terms of variable names. Okay plus um, 1 plus k over 4, oops, where is this, 1, 1 plus k over 4, times we had phi downwind minus phi upwind, okay, so we had phi, oops, phi downwind, let me put parentheses, minus phi upwind, um, yep, minus phi C. So phi upwind. So that's our flux. Agreed? Let me make this a little wider over here. So that's our flux. This is our formula for the flux. And finally, the update. You just take this update that we did over here. Flux east, flux west. Okay. So flux east flux west and now this would be this has to be phi um, at so the corrector would can still contain phi at n okay so it needs to be phi at n over here not phi at n plus half it still has to be phi at n and then the rest is simple uh, I forgot an over 2 over here so because this is half a time step this should be delta t over 2 and then this would be a full time step over here. This is C delta T over delta X flux east minus flux west. Okay. I'll give you a minute to um, catch up. And then T plus equal delta T solution that append phi. Okay. Are we all caught up? Not quite. All right, take a minute. Oops. On the, uh, the flux calculation, the flux 2 through negative 2, uh, could you move the cell a little bit to the right so I can see the end of the equation? Yes, this one. This one? Oh, okay, so I did, I'm just making sure I got it all. Yeah. It's kind of a bunch of parentheses <laughs> nested on top of each other, right?
Good. Everybody, um, are you all caught up? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Anybody still working on this? Okay. All right. Do you think this is going to work? Let's run it. All right. So I'm going to go back here. And okay. So I didn't do any plotting yet. So I'm going to now. Um, uh, do some plotting just to store to store these values that I told you about. So, but we can run it and just um, oh, fix size equal. Okay. Okay. So I ran it and it just gave me the initial condition. And then if I do plt dot plot and the last one, so sol minus one. So if we do um, x and sol minus one. Um, it's going to show you something, right? So that's after one cycle of the solution, right? Um, and it's oscillatory. So let's animate this so that we can see better what's going on. Uh, and looks like we've been successful, thankfully. So let's do this and print plot fee at the end of each time step so this would be a t equals zero so i'm gonna plot phi after i do the time update actually so if i let me do it let me do it at the beginning let me do it at the beginning here so all i need to do is i'm going to store um so i'm going to store the solution okay phi um phi n i'm going to store the solution in something called im and then ims.append im and I'm not gonna plot every time step so um, let's skip every five or ten time steps for example or we can just keep it as is um, let's see maybe we, we let's put a counter um, skip plot um, or um, just i equals zero. I'm just adding counter i plus equal one. And if um, i modulo, um, let's say, you know, we skip every five time steps, then we plot. Okay, we make a plot. Okay, so let's let's run this again. Oops, ends that append. Not subscribable. Oh, it's not an array. My bad. It <laughs> should be parentheses. Yeah. Okay. So I created a bunch of things over here. Now we can animate. So check check how you can animate this. Um, so if you create a variable called any is equal animation dot artist animation. So apparently, what Python calls all of these plots, it calls them artists. And then you can animate those artists together, okay, on a figure. You give it the array of um, um, artists, which is ims, and you give it the um, interval between each artist. So it's similar, closely related to the frame rate, but how many milliseconds do you want to wait between each artist to be displayed? Let's say 50, and then I can just plot any animation okay so I need to zoom out obviously over here so see what happens very quickly very quickly very quickly we develop these oscillations where at the sharpest gradient but where the Gaussian is oops where the Gaussian is nothing is going on with the Gaussian okay we go one full cycle Okay, well, we go one, ah, come on. <laughs> we go one full cycle. We go one full cycle and they stay the same and then we start again, right? Is this what you're seeing? Is this what you're seeing? Hello? I'm, I'm not right now, but. 
Your if part you go to the if statement real quick. I think I just got that messed up. Okay. Here. Sorry, I had to zoom out a little bit. Let me zoom back in. Okay. I'll give you a minute to catch up. Brandon, you got it? No, I, I, I think, uh, I don't think I got the, uh, the Gaussian function correct. Oh, here. I think uh, I have something wrong with my boilerplate. Okay. Take your time, okay. I don't know why I did this step function like this. You could very easily do it as result equal mp dot ones like x. So it will it will create an array of ones and then simply say when um, x equal less than x zero you do this equal zero x less x greater than x one you put it to zero. So this statement x greater than x one x less than x zero gives a set of indices. Okay, so that's what we're gonna you're gonna be using in your flow over the object um, technology. <laughs> so yeah, it creates the same initial condition. So you can change it to this one if you want. Okay, are we good here? Yeah. Okay. Everybody else, you good with the boilerplate Gaussian step function? Yep. Brandon, you got the Gaussian? Uh, no, I'm still getting an error. What is the error? Oh, it's not intended after the defi uh, defining the function, sorry. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Yeah, Python is weird about indentation. Okay. Did anyone get it to run? I get an error on requested movie writer FF MPEG is not available. Mm. I get that one when, too. When you did an error, um, this one, when you do this one? Yeah. 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 Okay, you need FF MPEG installed, which is, uh, my guess is, you are you on Windows? Oh, uh, yeah. Both of you? Yeah, same here. Yeah, you need to figure out how to get FF MPEG installed. Um, you can probably have a distribution installed with Conda and Anaconda. You figure that out, okay? I'm, uh, I don't know how to get it working on Windows, but that's why you should all switch to a Linux-based system. Anyway, and also <laughs> to avoid the, the CrowdStrike bug. Oops, now YouTube is gonna ban me. Okay, so <laughs> instead, okay, instead of the animation, um, if you're having trouble with the animation, maybe you can just plot um, the last initial condition, the last condition. So plt dot plot, you know, x from two to minus two, and then um, sol minus one from two to minus two, and um, you you get this. Okay, so that's going to be your last. Um, uh, after some time and you see the the dispersion that's a lot of dispersion okay on that sharp signal okay now uh, Brandon you asked me how you can save this you can simply go so if you're able to do this for the record you can simply go and say any.save test.mp4 for example and you run it you see that will start over here it's computing something and then you go to your um, to your files directory and you see the file here and you can see it over here and you see a nice animation okay 
So that's how you would do this. So if you were to get um, FFmpeg working, um, this should work or export as images and get them uh, so create create an animation from the images. Did everyone get this plot? No? Yeah, no, I, I think I think I'm gonna have to go through and review your uh, your lecture. Okay, Joel. Yeah. You got it. Okay, Holden, Eric, Evan. Yeah, I got it. Okay, Adnan. I'm trying to still. Where are you stuck? I think I I need to install this. Uh, uh, no, I'm not getting it. I need to. I have some bugs maybe on your code. On, on my code, maybe so. What, yeah, okay, too. you don't want to fix it now. Okay, it's up to you. Um, yeah, I just want to see. Yeah. But it's okay. So now we can change this K scheme. So if you remember, I had the series here minus one. We had second order upwind, um, and if you remember, the second order upwind was this approximation. It was using. You'd think if upwind had no dispersion, second order upwind should even have even no dispersion even more diffusion and no dispersion. And so let's try it. So for k equal minus one, you run it. Okay, well, I can already see the dispersion. Ah, look at that. You see the dispersion now on the upwinded side of the, of the, of the, of the initial condition, right? Um, and so there's dispersion. No matter what value of k you choose. Um, so let's look at some other values. If you choose one half, which is quadratic interpolation, okay? So that's 0 0.5. Again, you run it. And you're going to see still dispersion. Um, the third or the centered scheme, of course, we're going to see a lot of dispersion. It's going to be stable because you're second order in time. Okay, so if you do one over here, you're going to get the second order scheme, but it disperses everywhere. Second order central scheme. Um, if you go um, third order upwind, 0 0.33, so one over three. And again, you know, you still see dispersion. The point is, no matter what value of K you choose, you are going to get a dispersive calculation. Okay, so that was a that's quite disappointing, right? Because we just went through all of this work to go second order in time and go second order in space or third order in space. And all we got was more and more kind of annoying errors. And if these schemes are going to work to capture sharp gradients, remember that historically they were using the Euler equations um, to simulate aerodynamic flows, and they need to figure out they needed to figure out how to advert shocks, and you get all of these errors. That was a huge disappointment. Okay, so that was a huge disappointment. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. Can you see the slides? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so low order schemes, which is the only up, the, only the upwind scheme, are dissipative but do not oscillate. We say they preserve monotonicity. We're going to define that word in a, in a little bit. High order schemes are more accurate but produce oscillations. We say they are dispersive. And at the time, this was hugely disappointing and nobody understood what's going on. They, they had these observations. And they didn't understand what's going on until Godunov came in. And this was the topic of his PhD. So in 1959, Sergei Godunov, um, uh, mathematician, Russian mathematician, he, this was the topic of his thesis. He said he discovered and proved that linear numerical schemes for solving PDEs, having the property of not generating new extrema, can be at most first order accurate. Or in other words, monotone behavior of a numerical solution cannot be assured for linear finite difference methods with more, more than first order accuracy. So what he's saying is that if you want to preserve the minima and maxima of your signal and not create new peaks or lows, that makes sense? If you don't want to create new extrema, so we started with the step function. It was between zero and one. When we used second order or third order schemes on it, we had less than zero values and greater than one values. So we broke the bounds of that signal. We broke its monotonicity. And what Godunov discovered is that 
you cannot guarantee you can only guarantee monotonicity with first order accuracy any any scheme that is more than first first order accurate is gonna break monotonicity this is insane right because now you ask yourself like what the heck are we gonna do how can we ever get second order in space so let's talk about a little bit about monotonicity what is monotonic behavior we say a function is is monotonically increasing um if for all i'm gonna give the math definition if for all x and y response value um, such that x is less than y one has f of x less than f of y so essentially it preserves the order of the variable likewise a, a function is called monotonically increasing if whenever x is less than y f of x is greater than f of y so you see these functions these drawings on the right that show you how a function is monotonically decreasing okay so if x is greater if if x is um so i have i have a typo over here if x is greater than y with monotonically decreasing okay then f of x is less than f of y and the opposite is true for monotonically increasing now if the function can uh, um we say it oscillates like visually it's easy to observe that we say that the function is non-monotonic Okay, so monotonicity is only preserved, can only preserve, can only be preserved with only first order schemes. Okay, so what can we do? How can we use a high order scheme but preserve monotonicity? Okay, well, we can add artificial viscosity. Okay, we can add artificial viscosity. Um, so, you know, artificially add a diffusion term adjust the viscosity so that the results are kind of reasonable and to dampen the oscillations okay we can uh, that's an easy way out um, but the more sophisticated way out is to use what we call non-linear discretization schemes so the keyword that you might have missed the keyword in godunov's theorem is linear godunov's theorem says you can for linear differential finite difference schemes for linear finite difference schemes at best you can be first order but what the heck is a nonlinear finite difference scheme can we even think of a nonlinear finite difference scheme well if you're approximating derivatives by definition like these rise over run approximations they're all linear there's nothing complicated about them right so how can we create nonlinear schemes what we're going to do we're gonna blend two linear schemes and blend them together with a nonlinear function that switches between linear and non uh, between first and second order depending when you're where you're at i'll explain that next week uh, uh, on thursday sorry but you know there's there's hope to figure this out okay beyond the simple artificial viscosity approach um, and we'll talk about nonlinear schemes which are essentially the precursor for what we call flux limiters or slope limiters okay so i hope um, you enjoyed the lecture today although i'm you know i'm not with you well i'll be with you on thursday okay um and uh please review this lecture i'll post it as soon as possible unfortunately the semester is so short we're not gonna have a chance to do i usually would do two more homework assignments but because you have the project which is due next week on thursday the presentations are due so um, I'm not going to do any homework assignments, so this is up. It's up to you to try to master this material. Um, I'm going to leave it up to you and you know your curiosity um, to review these lectures, keep your codes, implement the codes we did in class.